name is Bronwyn Morgan. I'm a professor of law in um, the UNSW, and we're delighted today to welcome you to this um, third forum on collaboration in the Meridian 180 uh, series on that. And for those of you who haven't, uh, uh, well, actually, let me just first welcome um, a, an acknowledgement of country before I begin in, on the official ceremonies. I'd like to acknowledge the Bedigal people that are the traditional custodians of this land. And I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past, present, and emerging. And in the spirit of my children's school, who also make a promise to try to extend their learning in respect to something else, in their case, to caring for animals and country. In this particular instance, I actually very much would like to extend my respect to and express my interest in learning more about the concepts of time and temporality that are um, intrinsic to indigenous knowledge. It's not something that's officially part of our uh, conversation here today, but I have often thought when listening to acknowledgements of country, what is it that um, this acknowledgement could bring something distinctive to our setting here? And I think that understanding of time and temporality from the indigenous worldview is, is certainly perhaps something that could haunt or uh, in a positive way, our conversation, and we might uh, touch on it at one time or another. Um, but for now, I will extend my respect as well to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. So we are here today, as I said, with Meridian 180. If you don't know what Meridian 180 is, um, it was created, initially founded by Annalise Riles, um, who is uh, now at Northwestern University in the US. Um, after a particular experience she had while doing ethnographic field research as an anthropologist in Japan's financial system um, at the time of the Fukushima earthquake and nuclear meltdown. And she was actually physically holed up in an office with some senior bankers um, in the shock of the aftermath of that. And the, the embodied visceral experience of being there in fear and isolation and, and wondering how our collective expertise and technology, technological knowledge had brought us to such an impasse, um, she decided that part of the problematic trajectory that had led to something as devastating as the Fukushima earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown were the devastating implications of silo-based research um, and the sort of separation of disciplinary knowledge as one from the other. So Meridian 180 was founded on the basis of that experience with an explicit motivation to make collaboration between disciplines and different types of knowledge come to the center of its conversations. And also critical to its founding was a sense that those conversations should have a spirit of open-endedness and even play at their center so that they weren't initially instrumental or focused on some form of output, which as we all know, is very dominant in our very instrumentally focused culture of today. So although Meridian 180 has produced many outputs, white papers, books, policies, and so on, along the way, the conversations that are at the core of its business are not output oriented and are not instrumental. And this one is, a, is, is very much an example of that today. So um, we hope that you will, and we will collectively learn from this. I'm gonna just briefly tell you who's here today and, and then have a brief introductory exercise and then we'll start in on a um, hearing from each of our speakers today. Um, so we have uh, Ben Newell, uh, who's a pro professor of cognitive psychology, uh, Chloe Spackman, who's director of programs at the Australian Futures Project. I'll say more about each of these as they speak. And Dorotia Fabian, who's professor um, in the music department in the Faculty of Arts and Social Science here at UNSW. And myself, as I say, I'm from the law school. So we have a range of disciplinary backgrounds here. Um, and of course, in the audience, we have, well, unknown, to, we don't know collectively what we have in the room. Maybe if, could I just get a show of hands as to who is actually sort of from campus in the academic sphere? And um, from campus, but sort of not directly in the academic sphere. I know that's a, sort of, and off campus. <laughs> off campus, including, you know, I know we've got several campuses. But <laughs> it's an interest. So we've got a, a real mix um, of those things. Now, you're not all seated directly next to somebody, but I'm going to ask you to do um, a brief exercise. And this is uh, thanks to Chloe Spackman, who um, is going to return to some comments on this exercise uh, when she speaks. But 
it involves speaking in pairs. So if you're not directly next to someone, have a think about that. And I'll just give you the um, explanation first. It's just a three-minute exercise. And in a sense, it's about um, experiencing what it means to, to linger a little longer on something which we often do, but we often don't give that much time to it. So it's, a, it's an experiment in temporality from the start. It's to ask each other in your pairs um, what interests you about collaboration. But the, the, the spin is that you're going to ask each other three times. Um, you're going to ask the same question. So it'll be one and a half minutes each. Person A asks person B, what interests you about collaboration? And then on hearing the answer, you ask that question again, but with reference to part of the answer that you've been given. So you're digging deeper. So what interests you about collaboration um, uh, given that you've said X or Y? That you, so you probe deeper into the answer and you build on that answer. And you do that three times. And it's, th it's three minutes for both ways. So we'll give you an indication when we've got to one and a half minutes and you'll swap. So it's just a brief exercise, um, but if you can, uh, find your pair if you're not mm -hmm. next to someone immediately and <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you everybody. This could Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Can you wrap up now? <laughs> it's certainly, <laughs> it's, you know, we'll hear some more um, during this, uh, this lunch period about embodied, uh, a sense of embodied uh, communication. But that was wonderful. That was just such a, a lively and quite joyous sense of embodied collaboration. So now, now we'll return to a, a slightly um, more traditional format Initially, each of our speakers is going to speak for about 10 minutes um, so that we can get these vastly different disciplinary um, inputs into this topic. So Ben, as I said, is um, a professor of cognitive psychology and his research focuses on the cognitive processes underlying judgment, choice and decision making and the application of this knowledge in a range of different areas from environmental, medical, financial and forensic contexts. He's also a member of the inaugural academic advisory panel of the behavioural economics team of the Australian government. I think the UK government has a similar team called the Nudge Unit, is that right? <laughs> which is, which is a much more sort of um, uh, visceral, uh, you know, it's, it's got that sort of mischievous, joyful sense that the, uh, this particular unit doesn't yet have, but maybe Ben will bring that to its spirit. <laughs> so thanks, Ben. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I, I haven't got any notes to talk from, and I felt that I would just uh, try to think of or give you some examples of the types of collaboration that, that I'm involved in and how this theme of timing, temporality works through all of those things. And I think collaboration for any academic, collaboration is absolutely central to, to everything that we do, um, be that from collaboration with, with honours students to PhD students, to colleagues, to postdocs, and I think it's it's it, you know academic. The, the 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 thing that we're most engaged in is the pursuit and exchange of ideas, and so having other people around you to exchange those ideas with, um, to feed off, to feed from, um, is absolutely central to everything that we do. So collaboration is is fundamental. When I think about um, going. I guess beyond just the, the, if you like, pure sphere of, of academic collaboration to thinking about, okay, well, what's the work that, that I'm interested, that I'm doing? How does that feed into um, larger societal problems? Then, then collaborations uh, take on a very different flavor, I think, a different, a different sense. And I think one of the things that, um, certainly I've struggled with, and I know that other academics sometimes are concerned about, is the, you know, the distinction between the pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake and making clear contributions to um, society and understanding major problems that, that are ongoing. My chosen kind of field of pursuit in academia, as, as uh, in the introduction, is, is decision-making, judgment and decision-making, which is an extremely broad 
abstract kind of topic. Now, when I bring that into the lab, I can construct very simple experiments. I can, I can think about, OK, here's the you know, discrete pieces of information I want to give people. I can then look at the choices that they make, and I can draw inferences about the types of theories and models that they must be using in order to, to make those judgments. But when we then play that out into um, the broader society and broader community, we need to collaborate then with the community, with the end user, with the people that are trying to solve these problems. And the, the behavioral economics team um, that was mentioned is, is an example of that, that kind of thing, the nudge unit in, in the UK. So for people that don't know, this idea of, of nudging or um, is basically trying to take some principles that we think we know from the psychology of judgment and decision making, behavioral economics, which are largely two terms which mean the, the same thing, um, and use those insights to, to develop policy, to try and design um, interventions, to try and understand how to improve people's um, well being. So it's, it's very, it's usually based on very simple changes to the, to the, choices that people might make, so making it the default to be an organ donor rather than having to select to be an organ donor, for example. Just making that very simple change in the way that the choice is set up has a huge influence on the number of people that, um, that are donors. And using those kinds of, of insights, giving people information about how many other people behave in this way. So when you get your energy bill and you see how you perform relative to other people on your street, that's a kind of nudge, that's a kind of psychological uh, Manipulation is the wrong word, but um, <laughs> suggestion to, to, to behave in a slightly different way. And in order to um, collaborate on those kinds of projects, it, it does take the, 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 the timing aspect of that and the to and fro aspect of that is, is very um, complex to navigate. And I think that you have to be very careful in how you align those goals and how you, how you set up the, the projects. One example that I can, concrete example I can give is of a, a current PhD student who has been working on um, a, an extremely important issue to do with uh, child protection and mandatory reporting of abuse in, in uh, child protection situations. And we have uh, run a project initially in, in conjunction with the behavioral insights team in the family and community services in New South Wales government um, with the goal to basically improve communication between facts and mandatory reporters, to improve the feedback they get about when they make a report, whether it's the right kind of information that they're giving. There were a variety of reasons why they needed that system to improve. Now, this student of mine that came, Annalise Bolton, she'd worked for facts previously. She'd been on a student with me, so the, the timing aspect of this is very, it's, it's over a 10 plus year period. She'd been an honest student with me, then she'd gone to work for facts, then she'd come back and, and seen these problems face to face and wanted to try and use her psychology and use this ideas about um, nudges and insights to try and improve the process. But she was starting a PhD. The timings of PhDs are, you know, very prescribed. You, 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 it's, it's, it's simple if you're doing a, a lab-based project, you know, in my world where we, we bring people into the lab, we give them some experiment to do, we draw our inferences, we um, update our models and theories. But if you're going out into the community and you're saying, right, I need this project to, to run, but I have to run it within this first year of my thesis, otherwise I don't have the data, and if I don't have the data, I can't. But at the same time, you're having these, the conversations with the people who are there, and you're having to say, well, I need you know, X number of hours of your people's time. Your people are already extremely busy. Um, but if you want this project to, to work and you want to get some um, usable results from it, then we have to kind of meet um, halfway. And I think those, those kind of conversations about compromise and about what, what are the the lines in the sand, if you like, from, from the academic or scientific perspective versus what the, what the partner, what the collaborator needs. And a lot of the discussions I have with the, the beta guys are about, um, okay, so here's the problem that we want to try and address. Here are some of the tools that we could apply to try and address that problem. Here's the time frame that we have from the government side. You know, my, we, need a, we need an answer within six months. Um, 
six months seems like a long time, but for an academic timeline, that's, you know, that's, you're, just, you're still scratching your chin and wondering what to do after six months. Um, so it's negotiating that, it's getting those kinds of uh, temporalities right. But I think if you can do it, then, then the outcomes are extremely useful. So in, in terms of other kind of concrete collaborations, I've, I've had um, several linkage, ARC linkage project grants, which are grants which are um, designed to, to, to have this collaborative aspect to them. So where you, you as the researcher propose a particular idea and then you have a partner that comes in and joins you and provide some of the funds um, to uh, run a project. So I've had one with, uh, when I got the project, it was with the Department of Climate Change. And by the time the project finished, it was called the Department of Energy uh, or Environment or Climate Change wasn't a thing by the time the project. And that, that's a, a collaborative challenge, right? When we started the project, there were, it was to do with science communication. There were 20 people in the science communication team around climate change. By the time the project finished, there was one person in that team. Um, I've also had projects with, with uh, UniSuper, the, the superannuation provider. And although that, those things might seem quite different, I think both of those projects involve another temporal aspect, which is, is getting people to, to, to think outside their present focus or present bias, if you like. So there's lots of results in psychology showing how people tend to discount the future much more than the present and getting people outside that discounting framework, that, that uh, present focus or present bias is an increasingly difficult problem, I think. And again, you can use these kinds of psychological tools, psychological insights to push people outside that focus, to get them to think about climate change, to get them to think about their, their uh, pension in retirement and, and, and so on. So I, I think all of those aspects of collaboration bring you, force you to change your focus as a researcher to think about where your research is actually headed beyond the journal articles that you might be, you might be publishing. And so I think it's, it's absolutely crucial. Thank you, Ben. It's, that's actually a perfect segue, um, these points you've been making at the end about going beyond the present. Um, because our second speaker, Chloe Spackman, as I said, she directs the Australian Futures Project. So this is outside the academy. It's a non-partisan, non-profit organisation, but specifically dedicated to ending short-termism in Australia. So a perfect um, you know, kind of complement to people interested in doing that within academia and then um, your perspective on how that operates from outside. Just last week, she delivered the Parliamentary Leaders Programme here in New South Wales, which is a pro programme that brings together politicians from across party lines um, for two days to develop collaborative skills uh, in which they might improve the efficacy of the political process. So no small task. <laughs> um, so thank you, Chloe. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming here and spending two hours to have this conversation. I have to admit, when I uh, first spoke to Noelle about what the theme was today, I, I felt a little bit flummoxed. I thought, collaboration, yes, we do a lot of that, I can speak about that, but temporality, time, rhythm, not so sure what I have to say about that. But the more I thought about it, the more I realised that actually I quite instinctively take into account um, time and, and rhythm in the work I do, particularly when it comes to collaboration. And when I think about the work that Australian Futures Project uh, does, well, actually temporality really underpins our work in two big ways. So one, we exist to end short-termism. So we're concerned that Australia is trapped in this dangerous short-term bubble. And this is stopping us from making progress on these really critical issues to Australia's long-term flourishing. And secondly, we work using a systems perspective. So we don't work with any uh, one discipline or in one sector. Uh, we look at the entire system and we look at all the interactions and dynamics of that system and we try to find points where parts of that system are broken or where there are opportunities to pull levers for change. And when we find those points, uh, we design interventions uh, which are designed to be catalytic fixes. So even in that scientific sense of catalytic being to speed up a process. So it was quite interesting to me to reflect on the fact that actually um, the work we're doing really is based on uh, these very temporal ideas. 
Uh, so the very nature of our work is to look at the system and understand what the time horizons are and then think about how and when we might intervene uh, to extend those time horizons uh, for the benefit of Australia's long-term future. And we do this by uh, mapping out and understanding what a really robust, fit-for-purpose, future-making system might look like. And then we work to create that in a number of ways. So one, we collect data and insights and research on the future-making system. Uh, we also work with the media and outside of the media to change and elevate the national conversation so that uh, we are actually talking about the future and not trapped in this short-term conversation. Uh, we identify solutions and then design interventions into that system where we see those broken bits or those opportunities and levers for change. And lastly, we work with other people who are trying to fix the system and who might benefit from some of our expertise or experience. So as you can tell, all of that work is very collaborative. And uh, we have a small team, we're only four people, so there's no way we could do that work if we weren't collaborating broadly and widely. And I thought for the purposes of this discussion, I'd talk about um, one particular solution or intervention that Australian Futures Project created, um, which was already mentioned by Bronwyn, and that's the Parliamentary Leaders Program. Uh, so th the Parliamentary Leaders Program is a two-day professional development or leadership course for parliamentarians. And it actually came about um, from our systems and collaboration approach. So about six years ago, Australian Futures Project ran a round table with senior public servants and senior politicians and said, okay, we know that government is ill-prepared to deal with the challenges that we're facing in Australia. So what could we do about it? And it was then suggested to us that uh, one of the gaps was that parliamentarians have absolutely no access to professional development. So they have this really hard job, no matter what you think of how well they're performing in that job, it is very hard. And you know they go through this often very gruelling experience just to get elected. Then they're faced with a whole new set of complex issues, which is very hard for any one person uh, to address. So that was really the genesis for us. Uh, we then designed, tested and created the Parliamentary Leaders Program. And I think why it's useful uh, in particular for this conversation is because it really highlights two key considerations when we're talking about collaboration and how time comes to bear on collaboration. And that is, firstly, that there are institutional and cultural perceptions of time and how we are allowed to use the time that's at our disposal. And the second is that we can actually design engagements with a certain rhythm and cadence that allows us to build the right conditions to have meaningful collaboration. So if we go to the first one, which is that idea that there are institutional and cultural perceptions of time, um, we, a major barrier for us with the Parliamentary Leaders Program is getting people to actually register to do the course. So when people go through the course, uh, we get extremely positive feedback. We have people who have major breakthroughs who have a really transformative experience across those two days. And often at the end of it, they're saying, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I spent the two days doing that. In fact, it should have been at least three days. Um, why can't we extend it? But we actually have a lot of trouble getting people to sign up. So we um, said to parliamentarians, can you tell us a bit more about what the barrier is? Why aren't you signing up to the program? And Overwhelmingly, people said, time. We just don't have time to do a two-day professional development course. So that's obviously fair enough. They are very busy people. There's a lot of pressures on them. Um, but then you think about things like public sector leaders or corporate leaders. And you know, it's really just par for the course that even people sort of in the C-suite or in, in, in top positions would be expected to spend time developing their profession and working on their leadership. So what's the difference? So we went back and had conversations with the parliamentarians, dug a little bit deeper, and what we found was really there was a stigma attached to taking two days to do professional development, particularly in leadership. So, you know, they felt that 
internally within Parliament, the um, idea is you should be spending that time with constituents or on your party responsibilities, and that spending two days to do a leadership course was really self-indulgent. So you get this sense after digging a bit deeper that um, they're really out of step with some of the other industries and the other practices. And whilst it may be difficult um, for them to spend that time like it is for all of us, I'm sure everyone feels like they don't have enough time in their lives, um, it was really a cultural and an institutional perception that they shouldn't spend that time. And this is a really important breakthrough for them personally to have, to realise that this perceived barrier of time was just that, it was perceived, and that they could actually think about it differently and approach it differently. Um, the second about designing something with um, a rhythm and cadence that helps with engagement. So as I said, the course is two days, and we have two big aims with that program. The first is that we want to give parliamentarians a, transfor a transformative experience where they can reconnect with their core values and the reason they actually went into parliament in the first place and think about how they are acting or how they are getting towards the legacy that they might want to create. Then we want them to think about how they actually have agency within their own system. So we want them to reflect on how they could be stewards of their own system and actually change the political system from the inside out. Um, so that's a lot to achieve in two days. However, um, the way we've actually carefully designed the engagement with them actually starts six months out from those two days. So we have at least eight very specific and different types of engagement that we do with them across those six months. And they are designed to slowly build uh, the authorising environment and the trust that's required for them to come along and have that experience. So, of course, they also have administrative purposes. So, you know, it's things like going to Parliament and doing a half-hour presentation on what they can expect and getting an alumni to speak about their experience. But they're also what I like to refer to as micro-experiences. And we design all of that very intentionally to build that authorising environment and trust. And when they get into the room, uh, we also have a series of approaches and tools and even mindsets that we use as facilitators to set up that experience so that within two days they can have a transformative experience. And invariably, we find that by halfway through day one of that course, we've had a room of 20 just speaking about the course I did the other week, 20 politicians who come from all different parties, independents, upper house, lower house, five different states, they have all willingly co-created ground rules to create a safe space where they can be vulnerable. And by that point, we've usually had a handful of people actually demonstrate vulnerability within that space. That's half a day. And we know how divisive and how brutal modern politics is. So, I mean, that's no small feat, but that's part of very intentional um, activities that we do uh, to steward the day and how it evolves. Um, so thinking about, well, how could you apply this? Um, obviously without me knowing specifically what all of your interest is today, I think there are two key takeaways. Uh, the first is that, um, you know, it's very important if you're seeking to collaborate to think about what might be those institutional or cultural perceptions of time that the individual or the people you're choosing to work with have that they might not be aware of at all. <laughs> but even more importantly, I think it's really important to spend time to reflect on what your personal uh, perceptions of time and how you can use your time um, are and, and what you're bringing to that collaboration. And even taking a bit of a systems perspective on your work. So um, everyone has their sort of niche area that they're focused on and they understand their issue or their challenge within that particular lens. But if you step back and take a systems view, you might realise that applying effort over here is actually going to be better for getting the impact that you want on the issue that you're focused on. And the second thing, I think, is just to know that when you are seeking to collaborate with people, it can be really helpful to design those experiences from the outset with a lot of intention. So everything from how you first approach them, um, how you run a workshop, how do you set up the ground rules for how that workshop's going to run, 
you know, what space do you host that in, et cetera. And just uh, to summarise some of my thoughts, I think genuine and meaningful collaboration requires trust. And trust takes time to build. But I think, you know, in our busy lives and we've all got a lot of time pressures, we can think that we, you know, that can be a disincentive to really trying to build the right circumstances for collaboration. But I think, one, it's, it's worth it. It's worth putting in the energy. And in fact, I think the challenges that we're facing, it's required of us. But also, um, as I mentioned with what we do with the parliamentary leaders, there are tips and tricks and approaches and intentions we can bring to that experience to speed up that process. Thank you, Chloe. For some reason, as I was listening to that, I was thinking, it, it's a, another experience for me of thinking, you know, that is something that we as academics in designing these linkage projects that Ben talked about could, you know, really benefit from spending more intentional time about thinking about those time aspects of designing. And um, analogous to, I had a, a day-long professional training last year, I think it was, or the year before, but from a drama coach about how to throw my voice. I don't know if I'm actually <laughs> <laughs> putting this into perspective, into, in, into practice. But it was, she was from a, a dramatic background and the entire presentation on, was on how we teach. And I thought in 20, 20 years, I think, including my PhD of teaching, no one had ever trained me in anything to do with the performative aspect of teaching. It's, it's actually incredible. So uh, we, listening to you makes me think the same applies to this, this business of designing in time. So. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, we turning now um, to Dorotia, who has a, um, a third and different again perspective on this. Um, as I mentioned, she's in the music department, but she's also Associate Dean of Research Training. So um, her research actually focuses on interpretation of Western classical concert music, how it changes over time, and how culture influences those changes. But as Associate Dean of Research, she also has to bring um, many different research disciplines across the faculty into dialogue with each other. So. Mm. Well, thank you very much. And listening to my colleagues, I thought, hmm, I will talk about something very different. Um, because, yes, collaboration um, has many similar threads in, in an academic context. And I have collaborated with musicians um, to get to the bottom of certain aesthetic issues and certain behavioral issues. but. I thought I would rather bring in the perspective of how musicians collaborate with each other. And therefore, there is not much research necessarily that I will talk about, um, although I might um, be able to draw um, possibilities out. But the musician lives in a very temporal world, and everything they do is is non-verbal and, and under time pressure. We have been talking about um, finding the right um, time frame between a PhD and a, a, a deliverable project and the, the industry partner wanting it in a particular time frame that doesn't necessarily match the PhD time frame. We also talked about time poor executives. Um, the musician time pressure is that the show must go on. And the show requires a few rehearsals. Um, and the rehearsal is obviously very important, but again, everybody's time poor because they also play in an orchestra or in another band or teach or do this or do that. So there's usually a two hour rehearsal and, and a two-hour concert, usually within three days. Yeah? They also travel and tour with the program. Uh, so the collaboration is very intense and very specifically targeting particular points. Uh, everybody is professional. Everybody is interested in technical perfection, but also the emotional communication. So the performance comes along, and that's another set of collaboration, where you actually have to collaborate in front of an audience. And
don't normally talk about it in terms of collaboration, but that's exactly what happens, whether it's an orchestra or a band or a string quartet or a piano and a singer or a whole opera production. These are, all have their own um, very anxiety-inducing moments, and all these people are quite highly strung. Yeah? <laughs> and, and especially when the, when the show is about to start. There's a whole um, library of research on music performance anxiety um, and how to deal with that. And then the kind of personalities, and they know each other's weaknesses, and then how they protect each other, or how they, um, how they face up with an unknown situation, like opera singers in particular, they travel from London to New York to Milan um, and other minor places, and they sing the same role, so that's all right, they know what to do. But there's a different tenor, or if I'm the tenor, there's a different soprano, a different conductor, different staging. I used to walk from here to there, and now I have to walk from here to there, and, and so on and so forth. And they often just come off the plane and straight into the theater. So how, how does the conductor help them to, to cope? Uh, is there somebody to walk them through the production so that they know? Uh, at least uh, how to move on stage. And then the audience immediately reacts. We, we fear our peer reviews, right? Mm -hmm. And when the peer review comes, we think, oh, I just let it there for a, for a day in the, in the email, and I will have a cup of tea, and then I will read it. Because <laughs> inevitably, it will be critical. Well, the, the, the musician goes on stage, and craves the, 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 the applause. So usually the first item is the most full of tension. And then they feel the audience, and then they relax into it, and then they play somewhat differently. So all these emotional and, and uh, vulnerable and anxiety-driven situations are, are, are things that a musician have to uh, understand and develop a, a coping mechanism. And if you are talking about how they <clears throat> manage misalignments, then, then we, we can think of um, famous bands that last 20 years and they only play with each other because that's what works. And then somebody moves out of the band and suddenly the band collapses. Yeah? So, Musicians don't collaborate with somebody that they don't like, or they don't understand musically, or their aesthetic preferences are different, or their taste, or their cultural background, their, how they develop as musicians differ. It's very rare to find um, chamber musicians, uh, like somebody from the Ukraine um, living there, uh, collaborating with somebody from New York who lives in New York. It's just not, not something, they might do it for once, for whatever, uh, but it's not something that they continue. Because, because these kind of nonverbal understandings and gestures and communication just doesn't usually happen across cultures. Um, of course, if you move your culture, with, then things can happen. Another, another temporality that they have to... So, so on the one hand, you have these standard groups that they know each other inside out, first and husband and wife often. Uh, they travel together, play together, they are emotionally vulnerable together. Um, and they, they have a life and they don't really play with much many other musicians. Or you have... Uh, this traveling virtuoso who is always playing with somebody else and, and mostly everybody follows that person and he, can, he or she can just do what they, they want. Uh, and then, uh, then there is also the, the sort of more independent artist who is, who is, uh, who is trying to put on, on um, different shows um, and, and different... Um, um, uh, programs um, 
and is looking for partners, looking for venues, looking for audiences, and then what, uh, how, how is that organized when everybody's calendar is booked three, four years ahead? You know, how, how do you time that, that you want to do, let's say you are a singer and you want to do a 50-minute program on, on, uh, in memory of Edith Piaf or something, or, or, or Marlene Dietrich, and, and, and you, you find her letters to her lover, and you, you, you want an actor who can dance and who may be able to sing a bit, but not as good as you, because you are the singer, <laughs> and, and so on and so on. And then, and then also then find the right venue, and then how to promote it, and so on and so forth. A lot of layers of collaboration and communication skills and people skills. Um, when, when a researcher comes along and wants to collaborate with a musician, then it's important to, to have an understanding that they usually not verbal, so they, they don't like to talk about what they do, but they are happy for you to observe what they do and then try uh, and figure it out and maybe suggest that is it an okay reading of what you are doing how I analyze what you are doing, and then they say, oh yeah, well, I don't really care, that's your problem, deal with it, right? Um, so another thing is that you have to give them time. When I did um, an, an experiment uh, about 20 years ago, or what, 10 years ago, I don't remember, um, I was very interested in, in performing Baroque music 18th century music in a, in a historically informed way. So with 18th century instruments and how uh, uh, our written sources talk about performances in the 18th century, somehow recreating that. And there's lots of literature on this and whatever. And, and I, uh, there is also, uh, anyway, no, maybe that's not, not important. What, what is important that I wanted to reverse engineer because a lot of Baroque music was performed in a romantic or a modern way. So I thought, why don't I ask somebody to play a romantic piece the Baroque way? And then I can show to everybody that these are particular performance parameters that in particular context the musician employs, te technical aspects of how to play that instrument. And I had a, a, a friend who was an excellent violinist and actually had an engineering degree as well and was very articulate. So, you know, often you don't choose the best violinist, but you choose somebody who is, who is, who can cope with an experimental situation and who is willing to make himself more vulnerable. And then I, I, he came into the studio and, and then, and then we just asked him to, oh, here is a score, can you play it as if it was a Baroque score? And he said, what? <laughs> you know, it was, it caused, went against all his in, in internalized way of playing that fairly famous piece of music. Uh, but we gave him a, a half an hour and we left him alone and he sort of figured it out and did this and that. And when we came back to do the recording, it was amazing. He, he speed up the tempo, he put it into major mode instead of minor mode. He added trills and ornaments and the cadenza at the end. and and actually gave me so many ideas of it, what to do for the next stage of the experiment because then I realized that if I re-notate the score so that it looks like a Baroque score, then he will be freer in his, in his imagination to interpret that score. So you, you have to sort of work around their, their um, personalities, their, their technical um, know-how and their ingrained musicality uh, if you want to work with them. And then, as I said, you don't bring in Yasha Heifetz to do this experiment for you, but you bring in somebody who is, who is a very able violinist, but also open to such, such questions and hasn't, doesn't have uh, prejudice against them. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, let's give a little a preliminary round of applause. It's a wonderful basis for um, opening out from here and actually listening to uh, you speak about music made me think about jazz and the, you know, the sort of improvisation on a, on a theme, which is essentially what this panel is in that we've only met 
Um, well, no, we did have briefing calls before that. It's not the first time we've met. But, it, but there is a, a large degree of improvisation in this. And, and to me, if there was a motif running through all of these, it's actually about... They're, they're all in very different ways about the invisible stuff that makes collaboration work um, as it relates to time. Um, but, you know, the, the, the assumptions of behavioural economics, that behavioural economics seeks to leverage, if you like, those assumptions are buried in our habits. And um, Ben was speaking very much to those invisible um, dimensions. And Chloe speaking to the systems theory where you, you, you dig at what are the invisible systems that are making our practices work in certain ways. And then there's even more... It's not invisible in one sense, but it's invisible to the analytic, rational mind of research, the embodied emotional... I know there's a lot of research now on emotion and affect, but I think the means of how we represent these things are, are still very um, tricky. And dealing with them in ways that also enhances the communicative trust that, that Chloe was talking about. I mean, I think bringing these threads together um, will be fascinating in questions. So um, I'm going to start throwing it out to the audience. There's a mic that Noel has which we'd like you to use, I think, so that because this is being recorded, um, so that it helps record the questions. Um, anyone wish to start? Um, thank you very much for sharing your experience. It's been a really interesting and rich conversation so far. Um, in my work, I lead a lot of collaboration. And it's frequently between communities and governments and businesses. And one of the devices that I learnt to use quite early on was time. So thinking about what you do in a session where you've got a bunch of people together and maybe a range of different perspectives and you're trying to find a place where you can build alignment. And the future for me has always been that place. So rather than try and get everybody to align today on stuff that we're committed to right now, let's kind of loosen it up and say, well, in a few years' time, when you've got a new plan, what can we plan for today that will be different? Um, but I find now with the challenges that we're facing, we don't have the luxury of time. And I need new ways of getting people to think about um, when. When are we collaborating for? And how do we adjust mindsets to protect a future? Mm -hmm. Is that too late? Mm. Well, I... I, I, <laughs> no. I mean, that in, in, you were speaking to an intensified sense of urgency, I think, and how, how would any of uh, your sort of techniques that any of you have used alter in the face of that urgency? Funnily enough, I was coming in this morning um, listening to an interview by somebody called Bayo Akopo, I can't pronounce his last name, a fantastic Nigerian thinker, Akopo Malado. Anyway, he has a phrase that says, we are in a time of urgency, it's imperative to slow down. <laughs> so, yeah. Which actually this, I don't know yeah. if you have any thoughts. Well, that, that really rings true to me. I mean, this is a challenge that, you know, we're looking at every day and I don't have a sort of silver bullet answer and, and we try a lot of different um, tools and approaches particularly in, in workshop settings um, t to enable that. But I think, um, and I, I sort of indicated it in what I was talking about, I do think we need to have people appreciate that sometimes you need to go slow in order to then go fast. And so um, finding ways to convince people that it's worth putting in the time now um, and appreciating that that will help us go faster in the future. But that's very hard to do, of course, when you know, we feel panicked about a lot of the urgent issues. And you know, I think, obviously, right now, the most pertinent being climate change. Um, but I do think there are certain tools we can use. And it sounds like you also use them. And things like um, uh, scenario planning or futures planning, uh, we we've used that in workshops before. So that's not saying this is exactly what's going to happen, but it helps people have um, tools or a way to imagine various futures that could happen. And that helps with that positioning your mind into the future. Does anybody else want to? I mean, I, I think just from a, uh, a cognitive perspective, psychological perspective, one of the tools that we, that we all use all the time is, is mental simulation. Mm -hmm. We're always 
you know, a, a lot of when you're deciding what you're thinking of doing or what you want to do, you're simulating some future possible world or you're simulating counterfactuals. Or, so that, that ability to um, engage in that kind of mental time travel is something that we all, that we all have. And I think giving people tools or giving people the, uh, the right kind of incentives or the right kind of structure to allow them to do that and see whether it's through scenario planning or, or just your own scenario planning in your head um, allows you to, to do that kind of thing. Just just a, a, a comment. I wonder, it makes me, you know, Dorotha spoke a lot about the emotional investment that mm. the people you research have in that. And I recently attended a, um, a three-day retreat which had, you know, many of the echoes of what Chloe said about getting people to commit to um, in that. And it was a very, very positive experience, partly because we had lots of preparation given to us of the kind you said. But also we began the three days with a, an exercise that was quite exposing and got people to mm. speak to, initially to write down privately, but to speak to the emotional dimension of why they were there, essentially. And so we began the collaboration with that exposure to the sort of mutually shared emotion. And I'm just, I don't know if, I mean, it seems for Dorotcha that that's a, an easy way in for musicians. But Ben, if you're dealing with, you know, much more sort of rational thinking settings of policy making, and when people are under stress, does that kind of exposure to emotion cognitively likely to calm people down, or is it too variable to say? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that there's a single sim simple answer, but I, I do think that you, you know, there's evidence that you don't want to push to people too far on the emotional mm -hmm. reaction, because then you, with something like mm -hmm. climate change, then you're risking complete disengagement mm -hmm. And the, you know, throw up your hands, and mm. it's all too late. It's not worth it any yes. longer. So I think there is. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of of this idea that there is emotion and there is reason. I think that's nonsense. Mm. I think there's thinking, and mm. thinking involves lots of different aspects. Some might have emotional tags. Some might be, mm. but this notion of you know, any kind of dichotomy in in whether you want to call it intuitive and rational or emotional and rational, system one, it's, it's, it's rubbish. Mm -hmm. it's, there's thinking and there's thinking a little bit and there's thinking a bit more and there's thinking mm -hmm. broadly and narrowly. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I think that sometimes if you want to break down barriers and, and, and come closer to starting to think about what to do, um, Exposing people to their assumptions is is, a, is is can be very useful, and uh, and and you can have little you you know you can have little videos or whatever that that creates or, or shows scenarios that every you know you think you understand and then you realize that it's it's only in your culture it's only. Um, at your age or, or whatever, and and then then people suddenly kind of accept that they can they can have assumptions about all sorts of other things, and that's why we are not moving. Yeah? So breaking down these assumptions through whatever means, depending on what assumptions you want to break down, can can be very effective. I think. I might just. Expand on what Ben said. I agree about that. Um, you know how we think about reason and emotion, and one of the tools that we use at the start of every day of our courses. We run courses with public servants as well, but also in our team meetings, uh, we always start with a process called the check-in process, and everyone has to go around and answer three questions. So that's always, um, how are you feeling? Um, what is stopping you from being present today? And the third one you can change a bit, but let's say, what are you most looking forward to about today? But you can kind of alter that one. And it's so simple, a little bit like the three whys exercise, which I forgot to refer to. But you use that and it doesn't have to be a long, you know, it's not designed to be a sort of open up a therapy session, but it just means people can get out on the table. I'm tired. Last night I had to take my kid to emergency because I thought they're having appendicitis. And what's keeping me from being present is I have these three important meetings today or... So I think there are ways to get that emotional side out, but understand it in a practical sense. Mm -hmm. There's a question at the back. Oh, yeah. 
Um, thank you. I, I'd, I'd like to explore the theme of collective versus individual, because there's a lot of talk about, you know, what's holding me back or the I question, rather than the idea of community. Um, and maybe this is way too abstract, but that could be related to the idea of space and time, because we need to make space for activity. We need to make space on stage for the performance, because it won't work if it's a crowded stage mm. with too many people trying to occupy that same space. And particularly as individuals, unless it's an orchestra and it's orchestrated in some way. So two themes, one a collective versus individual idea and the idea of space and time. I hope they're not too abstract, but love your thoughts. <laughs> I can quickly comment on yeah. the collective. I, I think, you know, I was just watching uh, Peter Harcher from, um, you know, the SMH journalist talking about his quarterly essay and reflecting on that, um, you know, we're talking about how Australia has this issue to think long term. But, you know, China is a great example of a country that because they have that collective sense and, you know, I'm not commenting on, on whether what's in the quarterly essay is right or wrong or making any value assumptions on that, but that idea that they are making plans that they will not see the fruits of. Um, and so I do think that that's, that is a cultural thing and it can be challenged and we might have very different um, outcomes if we did challenge it. On the radio this morning, they, they spoke about ancestral bones of, of various First Nations people being returned to Australia, to this space. Um, so that there is, I think there's something to be said about community and a, a longer focus, um, you know, both going um, historically as well as forwards. Because it's, not, it's a collective rather than the individual. Yeah. But um, it's interesting that the study with the politicians were about, well, what, what were your aspirations? What can you do rather than what can we do? Um, mm. And address sort of the bipartisan and other issues that we have. So yeah. there's something to be said about collective and, and it might be linked to space. Any comments on the space side of my question? I'm not sure about the space, but just on the collective mm. in sort of intergenerational side of things that you're talking about, thinking just beyond my aspirations, but aspirations for future, future generations. And there is work um, in the psychological literature looking at how you can essentially evoke that kind of mindset or prime people to think in those particular ways and get them thinking about legacy, thinking about intergeneration, thinking about links, and how that then can sometimes have uh, positive impacts on the actions that people are going to take make, makes them more community orientated or makes them, if you, if, you, if you have a kind of commons dilemma type task that people are involved in and you get them thinking in terms of legacy generation, that can improve their, their donations uh, in those sorts of situations. I'm not, I'm not sure about the space aspect. Well, well, I suppose there is also this issue of, of the, the importance of the individual in the Anglo uh, world since what the 18th century or so, um, and and the capitalist um, economic situation also uh, very much um, foreshadows the, the individual. So that that is quite uh, acceptable or, or ex accepting accepted that nowadays this is a, a, a gut reaction that we are always talking about the individual, but it's. It's not the case in Greece, or not the case in Italy, or not the case among indigenous people. So it's, it's very much a, a, a long three, 400 years of tradition in a particular world, which now that particular world is starting to recognize that, ho oh, oh, maybe, ho, maybe we went a bit too far uh, in, in that direction. And then, of course, science can can help us come back, or, or anthropology can help us come back by looking at what other other cultures do. We we have this issue of of big families used to live together, and the the elder. I was just in Shanghai the last week or, or whenever, and and I was walking in the middle of Shanghai in these little alleys, and all the old ladies and 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 men were congregating in these courtyards and chatting about while cooking and whatever. You, there is no community in, in Sydney, even if you live in a block of flats. You know, I, I have been living in a block of flats for now nine years, and I don't I know one neighbour 
right? One out of 20 or something like that. So that's, that's very much, much a, a cultural thing. And, and the space, um, similarly, I, I think Sydney, I mean, for instance, the positive is that we have lots of parks and we value our parks and we, we, we value our foreshore walking um, uh, grounds and things like that. In, in, in Hungary, where I originally come from, they are building up all the parks. This is the latest madness, that we don't need parks. And then we cut down a lot of trees for the light rail, just not so long ago. So, so uh, I, 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 I think it's a very valid question, but there are so many different aspects to it uh, that we need, need to narrow it down a bit more to be able to address what, what aspect of space we want to talk about. But just, I'd like to just sort of add a thought that, um, a couple of thoughts from listening to you all, and um, I had thought when Dorotcha was speaking that those cultural specificities of your mm. experiences related in very much that way um, that you've articulated, but this is slightly uh, sort of extending, I think, beyond the specificities of this forum, but there is um, more and more interest in place-based community wealth building. It's rather a sort of mouthful, but um, I was told recently by the philanthropy department of this university that this is all the rage in the US philanthropic funding, place-based community wealth building. And I actually think there's something there about trying to work towards what is the sense of collective identity and collective desires and what, what a collective activity in, in settings that are rooted to physical place. And some of this, I think, is taking place through they call bioregional governance, so that you actually you take the park sort of idea and you say, well, let's let's take something that at least in our culture, people collectively value and collectively um, physically gather in, and say, well, let's look at that particular green space, and it might be larger than a park, but go from there and go outwards and and start to make decision making based on that. I mean, maybe this is something we could run a forum on um, in future times. Just one other quick mention is that Richard Dennis from the Australia Institute, who wrote a, a really uh, lively book that came out just before the last election called Dead Right, which I'm not sure if any, many people read, but it was in a way tried to pitch into the discussion about what should we be talking about in the election. And part of his argument was we need to have a, a, a more specific conversation about the collective interest um, especially in a time-sensitive way that, that you've been mentioning, um, at a national level, in a way that goes beyond just more jobs and economic growth, which is the sort of the go-to issues of many of the political parties. And he suggested that you could retool the Productivity Commission, which is a fairly unique and quite respected institution internationally, um, into something called the National Interest Commission. So instead of continually talking about productivity, we would actually have national conversations about what the national interests involve. I thought that was a really interesting suggestion that seems to have fallen into a, a dead pool, so I thought I'd mention it here. Uh, more questions? Less two there. <coughs> Where are we in time? Do we want to take two questions together? Oh, no. It's yeah, um, Thank you all so much for your time. It's been very interesting. Recently, I've been working on planning a research project with academic partners, um, Aboriginal community partners, and also government partners. And I've realised in this process that we have different time schedules, not only as individuals, but on a system-based level, we have different ideas of the time perspective of the project. Um, I wonder if you have any ideas about how to resolve disagreements or perhaps find a synergy when you are on different time schedules um, as a collaborative group? Um, I mean, as I was saying earlier, in, in my experience, I think that it, it does come down to, to compromise mm -hmm. and, and having to decide the, na the nature of the project that you might have had in mind at the start may not be the project that you that you end up with um, at the completion. But if there are certain elements of it, I mean, the, my experience is in you know, designing large experiments, randomized controlled trials, and, and there are certain things that you, that you cannot, you know, there are, there are lines in the sand where if you want this thing to work, it has to, it has to be like that. But there are other places where you can say, okay, well, maybe we, 
we can't have as many groups as we wanted to have or we can't run it for as long as we wanted to run it for, but we can still get something useful f from running it, from doing the trial. And, and so we had lots of back and forth conversations about the timing of those things and who would need to be involved and when they need to be involved. And I think one of the major lessons from that kind of collaboration was, and it sounds like you're already at this point, but is, is to get all of the relevant parties together early so that you, you try to map out where you think those roadblocks are gonna be and that, that the people that, that have the, the power in those different organizations are, are all there. Because one of the other big challenges that, that I've found with these kinds of projects um, is that the, the, the turnover of personnel in organizations is much, much higher than it typically is in academia. Academia is a pretty sticky organization, you know, type of job to be in, but you, you find the right person to talk to in the government department or the, the industry partner, and then six months down the track, they're not there anymore. And the person that takes their place may think, what's this, I've got no interest in that. So you, you, it's, it's identifying those linchpin people that are, it's really important. And I, I think if you are working with indigenous communities, then obviously um, there is the question of how important the problem it is for them and what other problems can over, you know, grow up on the ladder and therefore you get behind and they just say, yeah, well, that's the next thing we do, that's the next thing we do. Um, you have to build it's slow and you have to build up the relationship with the community and, and, and the group of elders who then um, you can nudge. Uh, when, you, when, you, when three months or six months after your, your original deadline, you can, you can say, well, look, you know, are we still interested in this project? Because they definitely are on a very different time scale. I just wanted to mention, um, thinking about the turnover point that Ben made, which is which is really um, a big a big issue. I agree. I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, I mean, this could have downsides, but there are some technology platforms where it might be that recording the process of, and also surfacing the different assumptions about what's imaginable in the timeframes um, uh, in certain kinds of platforms that or a record of what you've discussed, um, and that are private so that everybody can look at that, but it's not, I'm thinking of a particular platform called Lumio, which uh, records, it allows you to make decisions, but also just record processes that stay there in a very visible way. Um, in some ways that provides a kind of a research process data um, trail, which is both useful in terms of if nothing actually eventuates because of all these colliding times, there's something there that you can perhaps ask if you can write about. But also, assuming something does eventuate, there's a record of what was said when and what assumptions were held by which groups, um, if people change in particular. Um, and there is an interesting, I guess, ethics permission things about that and so on. And I know people might feel very differently about yet another technological platform, which is a different <laughs> issue, <laughs> but it's just a thought. Um, the man behind with the black T-shirt. <coughs> Thank you so much for, for your insight, guys. Um, I, I was thinking in high-performance teams and how collaboration happens in this kind of high-performance teams. For instance, I was thinking in basketball and sports in general. I grew up uh, watching the games of the Chicago Bulls, and they have um, three of the best players in history, uh, big egos, um, <laughs> difficult people, not the best human me, human beings sometimes, but um, and I can, you know, I can relate that personalities in academia as well, right? Uh, we, we, we have this kind of people sometimes, but uh, Phil Jackson, the, the, the head coach of the team, was able to make them win six championships and make them collaborate in the field. They don't talk each other outside of the field, but they were highly productive to achieve one goal. I was wondering if it's possible to transfer from domain to domain, from sports or music, uh, this kind of techniques or this kind of um, organic collaboration to academia, let's say, or politics. Or, um, I know that it's quite different, probably. Even the setup and the environment around us is, is different than the sport teams, but uh, uh, I, I suppose that there are a lot of 
worthy things and valuable things that we can learn from from sports high performance or music high performance. I don't know. YouTube was playing last weekend and you could hear them and obviously it's a big logistic exercise to bring a band like them and make them work for 30, for I don't know how old they are, but are probably very old. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah, I, I mean, um, I'm asking that because I'm an early academic career and I noticed I love how you define academia as a sticky environment. There's a lot of friction uh, until finally things happen. And uh, that can be a little bit frustrating, mm -hmm. just a little bit frustrating when you're a young academic. But um, can, can we get above this? Can we learn from other domains how to make more, how to have a better flow of collaboration? Yeah. Sorry. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we can. <laughs> uh, I th one one thing that stuck out then when you were when you were talking is that for a sports team there is one very single very obvious goal and that is to win. Every time you stand on the field, you you want to win, and so that makes I suppose the the interactions within the team. It's always focused on that particular goal of, of winning. Now, of course, if you break that down into, okay, well, what does each person in the team have to do in order to, to win and how many people are on the team? And, um, but I suppose one thing, that you, one thing that you can learn from that, and this is just really thinking off the top of my head, but is that, that a team that's focused on a single goal and has uh, each member of that team has a very specified role in that, in achieving that goal um, is one that maybe will coalesce a bit better. So if you're constructing an academic team or a collaboration between academic and, and industry, then you want to know what your role is in each of those things. And it's very good, very important, to, if, if it is a industry or government or something, is that you, that you identify one person, hopefully the person that doesn't change every six months, but that person is your champion in that organization. And, and to, as best as you can, you, you can kind of use them as a conduit into the rest of the organization to do something. And then within academia, you want to build a team. It's just like putting a team together to write a grant. You know, why, well, why is this person on the grant? Well, they're on the grant because they bring that, that skill. It's like, why is this person in the team? Well, he's super fast, or she's the one that can score the goals. Um, you know, I, th I think that, but but how then managing that interaction and the personalities within it? Uh, you need a you need a social psychologist for that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I definitely agree that the 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 single common goal is is a key in in these successful teams. These are also not particularly big three teams. And again, there's reasonably short-term goals. You know, you have the season and you have a match every week or whatever, and then, then you are out and you are either the champion this year or you are not. Um, same with the musicians. Uh, the concert is, is every second day or, or once a week or whatever, and they focus on that and then it's over. Whereas academia is long term, and then you send in your publication and it comes back from review, and then it's another. So, it, 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 to keep up the momentum, to keep up the team spirit, and then to acknowledge everybody as much as they deserve, uh, we are getting better at it, but it's still, um, you know, there is always the lead author, yeah? And the captain of a team is never doesn't get as much as the lead author. Yeah. So there are these um, sort of cultural issues that make, make people grudge when it's part of the team in academia. And also there are, I suppose, there are lots, academics tend to compete against each other rather than, rather than pay, play together. So. <coughs> Uh, I, I'll just say quickly that I think there would be a lot to learn for particular circumstances. Um, for us in our work, I think actually that's be antithetical to the way <laughs> that we would want to work just because the kind of collaboration and the systems approach we're taking is, is really about saying, well, we're not entirely sure what the answer is. So we're going to sit in the problem and we're going to question all of our assumptions and the roles we all play. 
So it's, mm. it's, I think it would be quite different in that sense. I, I actually thought of, and I don't know that I like this analogy, but when you were talking, I thought maybe something closer to the, the sort of future casting and less short-term focus of a high sports team, high-performance sports team, is the startup culture where you've, you're mm. putting together a team, but you know, what they're trying to do is quite open-ended and got quite long time horizons. And the previous um, university I worked at in the UK did these, uh, at least across disciplines, I don't know if this would work with outside entities like governments and community groups, but put, put us into what they called sandboxes. So for a day or two days, we, you know, you'd have a whole lot of people put into this sandbox and then you had to just collaborate around a range of facilitated activities with guaranteed funding at the end of the... So you'd all put together a pitch during that day or two days and one team would win that money by the end of the two days. I mean, it was a, I think it was, now looking back, I think it was drawing on startup culture. Although I, we, I didn't experience it as a sort of a com commercially driven activity in the context of the university and, and was part of a team that actually won some funding under that and then got to know those people sort of after the fact. And that intense experience at the time was very positive for, for the later relations. So I think, yeah, I think we're coming to the end. I, 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 I couldn't, this, this, I'm going to tell a joke. Time is important. I don't think it's got a terribly good punchline, but I like it. It's an artist, a therapist, and a politician went into a bar together, and the bartender said, excuse me, do any of you have the time? <laughs> and that's really us, <laughs> if you get it. It's very metaphorical, analogical, and not really that funny, but... <laughs> Thank you very much for coming um, to our event. Oh, well, let me thank extra people, um, especially, um, uh, sorry, um, I didn't want to just, I want to thank Sue and Elizabeth, but, um, uh, who, and the team who have enabled us to use this wonderful new venue, um, which we haven't been in before, which is Studio One, and it's called the Esme Timbery Creative Practice Lab. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Noel. I mean, you really put this together. And um, we've got new program in 2020 continuing this theme. We've got things like the science of collaboration, co-design, um, working with industry funders and partners, the art of constructive disagreement, collaborations with Asian partners, with indigenous partners, and again, circling back to trust. So join us again, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you.